There it is. There it is. If you have your Bibles, um, Matthew chapter 5, uh, second week here of our Summer on the Mount series. Um, where we'll be going through uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, we find there this is to be understood as likely the greatest sermon ever given. It's uh, the largest sermon that we have recorded that Jesus had gave to his disciples. But Scripture tells us that he saw this crowd and he went up on the hill and uh, there he preached. And though he preached in the hearing of multitudes of people, we know that his teaching here is primarily given to the twelve disciples whom he called who are sitting before him to hear what their teacher, what their master, what their Lord would have for them to learn and understand. Last week as we began, we looked at the Beatitudes and, and these blessings that Jesus lays out as he begins this sermon and for his disciples and here are the things, these attitudes in a way that you should have, some characteristics that should come about in your life and what comes along with these things if you walk in such a way are blessings. But as he teaches them, we know from Scripture that he teaches 12 and then he sends them out into the world. He sends them out to birth his church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. But as he sends them out to be the called out ones, they are not yet called up. For 2,000 years, as Jesus sent out his disciples after teaching them many things, they're called out of the world, but not caught up out of the world. They're still in the world. They're sent into, not out of. In John 17, verse 15, Jesus is praying for his disciples specifically and by extension, all his disciples from that point forward through the course of time until eternity in the future, Jesus prays thus. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus teaches his disciples to go into the world and to be a difference maker in the world. Until the day comes, until he returns and calls us out of the world. But between that point then that he teaches and his word is given and the point in the future to which he calls us up, he sends us out into the world. After a trip to the barbershop, Woodrow Wilson, he once noted this. He said, I was sitting in a barber chair when I became aware that a powerful personality had entered the room. He said, a man had come quietly in upon the same errand as I myself to have his hair cut and sat in the chair next to me. He said, every word the man uttered, though it was not in the least didactic, showed a personal interest in the man who was serving him. And before I got through with what was being done to me, I was aware I had attended an evangelistic service because Mr. D.L. Moody was in that chair. It says, I purposefully lingered in the room after he had left and noted the singular effect that his visit had brought upon the barbershop. They talked in undertones. They did not know his name, but they knew something had elevated their thoughts. And I felt that I left that place as I should have left a place of worship. He notes going to the barbershop at just a normal errand that we all go through multiple, countless times throughout our life. But in this particular encounter, he sits next to someone in a chair and just listens and sees and hears the mark that that individual left on a room. So much so that he feels as if he's walking out of a place of worship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer notes in his his book, The Cost of Discipleship, a simple fact. He says, disciples and people, they belong together. Jesus Christ sends us out into the world to make a difference in the world. Wherever we are at, we all get our hair cut. Maybe not all of us. But most of us get our hair cut. But that's simply a place that we can go make a difference and be different in the midst of the world that needs to see difference. 
Again, John 17, verse 16 through 18, following what Jesus says. He said, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. Here's what he says next as Jesus prays for his disciples. He says, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He says, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. The blessings of the Beatitudes here give way to responsibility at what Jesus says next following those. So let's read together verse 13 through 16 of Matthew chapter 5. Here's what Jesus says following these blessings that we talked about last week. He says, now you are the salt of the earth. He says, but if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. He says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So he lays out a responsibility following the blessing that he gives. Disciples, if you walk in these ways, if you are peacemakers, if you are merciful, if you're poor in spirit, if you're beggarly, if you understand your condition, if you understand your sin, your depravity, your absolute need for grace, and you mourn that sin, and if all these things are present leading to a place of hungering for righteousness and thirsting after his righteousness... And then experiencing the persecution of the world and all the blessings that come with that, there is a responsibility that follows. He says, you are now, if this is the case, you are my disciple. You are the salts of the earth. You are the light of the world. Now, as he's speaking to his disciples, you here is plural. You is the whole body. You is the church. It's not one grain of salt, but it's the whole shaker. It's every bit of it. He says, you, it's plural, but you here is also emphatic. He says, you are it. There's no other salt of the earth. There's no other light that's going to come about later. You are it. God's church is it. We are his plan A, where there is no plan B. He says, you are it. And the word there, um, the word are, there stresses being Rather than doing. Jesus is not giving his disciples here an imperative. He's not giving them a command. He's simply stating fact. He's saying if you are my disciple. You now are salt of the earth. You are light of the world. And large responsibility follows those two illustrations. For you and I. To be salt And to be light. Let's look first at salt. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now today, salt, it only flavors our food. It's on just about every table. In every kitchen. In just about every house. We have salt. And we use it to flavor our food. Some like it more than others. If you know me, I love salt. Probably too much do I love salt. At a Mexican food restaurant, I will often salt individual chips, but to go all there. But today, it, it flavors our food. That's pretty much the sole purpose of how we use salt, is to bring about flavoring in our food. But in ancient times, it cannot be overstated the value to which salt had. Today, we flip this word in many ways to how Jesus uses it here and what it means for his disciples. We refer to it in an upside-down way, and we call somebody salty to describe maybe an upset or angry or bitter mood that someone may have. Man, you're a little salty today. And we joke and we jest and we can use that, but how Jesus means this word is completely the opposite of being upset or bitter or moody. As I said in the first Century and in ancient times, its value cannot be overstated. Roman soldiers were often paid with salt, and they, that brings rise to the say, saying that someone is not worth their salt. But it was used, and it was a means of trading 
throughout those days because of its purpose and what salt could be used for. There's several things that we could look at here as far as its value. One, it was a mark of friendship in ancient times where friends would gather together and they would eat salt together and they would commune together and it was a mark of friendship. Even enemies that sat together, if they shared salt together, they had to act as if they were friends. That was the understanding. It was also used to bind covenants. Parties would eat salt together in an agreement, in a contract of sorts. You even see that in the law in Leviticus 2.13. It says, you shall season all of your grain offerings with salt. It says, you shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. You begin to see the importance and the value of it. There's something inherent in this mineral, in this element that is important, that, that binds things together. Now, there are several range, there's a range of suggested purposes here that Jesus may use to illustrate his point. And I want to talk about some that you find then. As I said, today we mainly use salt to flavor our food. And the same thing would exist back then. Salt still had flavor, though it was used for other things. But if we take this as Jesus' illustrative point that it simply flavors things, there's this idea that Christians are to go into the world and we should be flavorful. People should like the Christian. I've heard it said before, and I've even said it before, that Christians should be the most attractive people on the earth. And that may be true, but where is the reality? Are Christians the most attractive people on the earth? No, not in any sense. They should be, but oftentimes not. In one sense, if we're not being salty in the biblical sense then we're not going to be attractive, which we're all prone to do. But even if we are the most salty we can be in this truest sense, the world is not going to like us. We're not necessarily going to be attractive to the world. Jesus even says very plainly that in the world, they're going to hate you, but they hated me first. The more salty we are in this sense, in many places and pockets of this world, the world is not going to see us as attractive. The world is going to see us as repulsive. And you don't have to look far to see that being played out even today. When I think of believers, and blessed are those who are persecuted for his namesake, it wasn't long ago where a group of Christians are outside of an abortion clinic and they're praying and singing hymns, trying to love on and encourage women coming to this clinic. And they find themselves then to be arrested. They find themselves to be in violation of the law. They find themselves to be in court. They find themselves to be convicted of violating some act that Congress passed in the 1990s. And now all of a sudden these believers who were singing songs and praying, many of whom are now sentenced to prison because of their saltiness. I don't think that was Jesus' point to just convey and illustrate that we should be flavorful in the world. Yes, we should be. But his point cannot be simply that we should be attractive to this world. Because in the most negative sense, if we look to what would characterize us by that, is how much could we be looking to be attractive and then begin compromising based on looking to please this world and be attractive? We want the world to like us. How many churches have rendered themselves ineffective in ministry because they're trying to be too flavorful in this world? It's a risky thing to be liked and accepted because it gives way to compromise. But I do think of these individuals who did not compromise in their faith. But it also brings about persecution. That was just months ago, if you didn't know that. That it's happening now, it's happening in our culture. But yes, we should be flavorful, but I don't believe that's Jesus' main point. But salt also stings on wounds and on open wounds, right? Salt on an open wound, it stings, it burns. Could this be an illustrative point that Jesus may have for salt? As disciples, we go out into the world and we should be stinging, we should be convicting the world of sin. And in a sense, yes, I would say yes, we should be going out into the world, we should be not necessarily adding flavor, but we should be going into the dark places of this world, as we'll see in a little bit, shining light on the sin of this world, convicting that, 
And we know that the gospel is offensive. Whenever we're, we're faced with our sin and you have an individual having to reconcile with that and they begin to hear that they're poor and they should be beggarly and should be mourning, but they don't want to do those things, the gospel can sting. The salt can sting. So it's not a bad point. But constantly convicting and never loving also has a negative impact on the world that we are meant to save. So I don't know if that was Jesus' main point. Or illustrative point here. Another attribute of salt is that it creates thirst. Could this be what Jesus meant? For livestock, we have salt blocks so that these foolish animals would lick it and they would become thirsty. And on a hot day, it would lead them to water so that they would hydrate themselves. We live in a spiritually weak and morally depraved world to where we have the ignorance of the unbelievers who are blinded to their condition need to have a thirst. They need to be reminded and told and shown. If we're the salts of the earth, we're to make the world thirsty for His righteousness. Wouldn't that be a thing that would be good for the disciple to do? But again, not a bad point. People being unaware of a critical need often need a catalyst to bring about awareness of that need. So that's true. We can see that Jesus may use that there, but I think that the main characteristic of salt that Jesus had in mind was that it preserves. The main thing in ancient times that brought the value of salt to such an extent where wars were fought over salt was that it preserves, it staves off decay. John MacArthur, he notes this. He says, when the church is taken out of the world at the rapture. He says, Satan's perverse and wicked power will be unleashed in an unprecedented way. He said, evil will go wild and demons will be almost unbridled. Once God's people are removed from it, it will take only seven years for the world to descend into the very pits of hellishness. He just notes that that when the time comes and the church is raptured out we are called out of this earth it will take seven years for it to go that bad to where jesus will return in person to rule and reign if we are the salt of the earth that we are the preserving agent against the decay of this world and in a way as we look at this world we can see that it seems to be quickening The decay in which we see, the moral depravity that seems to be running more rampantly than it ever has. Now, the world has always been sick. We know that from Scripture. From the fall, the world has been sick and depraved. But Scripture tells us that it will only become worse. But for now, we are here. The church is here. We're sent into the world. We're empowered by His Spirit We are to be the fruit of the Spirit, to not hold back those things. But as we live out the fruit of His Spirit, it does hold back the moral and spiritual decay of this fallen world. That is a responsibility that we've been given as salt of the earth. But sadly, as we look at the rate of decay, I think it's important to point out this strong admonition that Jesus gives us. In verse 13, he tells us what we are emphatically, a statement of fact. It's a point of being that we are the salt of the earth. But then he gives this admonition. He says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? He says, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So if, if, if salt has lost its tastiness, its flavor, it can't be, you don't salt salt. Once the flavor is gone, it's gone. But now, chemically, pure salt cannot lose its flavor. But now Jesus is not giving his disciples a chemistry lesson. So what's his point here? If if salt cannot lose its taste, what does he mean when we read, but if salt has lost its taste? If it's physically impossible, what is he getting at? But in the first century there, you know that, that not all the salt that hit the table in ancient times, was pure salt. In the region of Palestine, you had the Dead Sea, where everything flowed downward to the Dead Sea, and nothing came out of the Dead Sea. It was also known as the Salt Sea. 
But salt that would come out of the Dead Sea wasn't pure in that it, it would come with other minerals that would contaminate that salt. And whenever that contaminated salt got to someone's house, then it did lose its flavor. The salt was still there. The salt still had flavor in it. But all the other contaminating minerals would dilute the flavor of that salt. So when it was found in a household to be that impure, it was just simply tossed out. If it hit the salt shaker or whatever it may be in someone's house and it was diluted and contaminated in such a way to where it didn't even taste good, that salt was gathered up and it was tossed out. But it's interesting too that as you think about that and what they would do is they would toss out this impure salt that was tasteless and bad. They would make sure not to toss it where grass would grow or where crops would grow because it would set in there and then it would rob the soil and it would dilute the soil and you wouldn't have good crop because you see what bad salt begins to do. It prohibits growth. So what would they do with this bad salt? They would throw it out into the road where over time trampled under people's feet as people come and go. It would make sure on that roadbed nothing grew and eventually just slide into the dust under people's feet. Such as the uselessness and tastelessness of a Christian that is contaminated by the world around them. He says there it's lost its taste. The word in the Greek is morino. And it doesn't necessarily mean taste. It can mean taste, but it also means more times than not, as it's used in the New Testament, it means to be foolish or to act Foolishly. Foolish is the Christian who's lost his flavor, who has been contaminated by the world around it. A trait that Christians in this world, the world over, are capable of displaying. Paul notes as much about himself in Romans chapter 7, verse 18 through 20. I want to read this for you. He says this, he says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. He says, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. He says, now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. This is the Apostle Paul, a regenerate man saved by grace, but understanding he still lives in this body of death, this flesh. And he understands that he is a moment of weakness of character and poor decision away from being worthless and useless in the kingdom. To becoming foolish. But Paul notes, he says, but but wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He says, thanks be to God in Jesus Christ. He understands where his salvation comes from. He understands that his salvation is is secure But he understands the foolishness to which he could trip and fall into if he's not pursuing the Lord in the way that he should. Such as he tells the Galatian church is that if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh and the Spirit are are bouncing and opposed to one another. They do not mix. There's a contamination that can happen when we walk in the flesh where we render ourselves useless in God's kingdom. And Jesus gives an admonition to his disciples, don't fall into this place. But the rate of decay in our world is a fact. And it's a result of the foolishness that's too often pervade in congregations across the Western world. Too many congregations have the appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. Too many congregations would claim Jesus Christ and and adherence to His Word, but they twist and distort His Word. Or they just take parts of His Word completely out. That doesn't mean that anymore. The United Methodist Church is no longer united. Because foolishness pervade its leadership and its teaching. And they take God's word out of its context. Or they rewrite it. Or they say that this doesn't mean that anymore. And it causes decay. Because they've been contaminated 
and it becomes useless. No more salty than that salt that's taken from the Dead Sea. But we should reflect on our own hearts and our own work and, and to determine our own saltiness. We should look inwardly at who we are and what we were doing in terms of being the salt of the earth. Are we contaminated by other minerals? Or at worst, are we the other minerals bringing about the contamination, causing things to be tossed out? It is possible to come and to share and to be a part. Jesus said as much. He says, one day they're going to come to me and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, did I not do all these things in your name? And Jesus will say, away from me, you workers of lawlessness, for I never knew you. It's possible to share in the assembly. It's possible to have your mind opened to the things of the Spirit, to share in the Spirit and the work of the Spirit, but your heart be far from the Lord. It's possible to come and go inside the church, but be far from the Lord, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power and being a contamination, being a mineral instead of the salt that is meant to be flavorful. If there's any question in your heart as to your saltiness, pursue the Lord and ask Him to reveal to you areas where you may be contaminating or you're contaminated. Areas where you need to be purified. 1 John 1, 9 says, Confess your sins and He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. To bring about purity in life for the first time or restore the purity of your life. Because great is the responsibility to be the salt of the earth. Next illustration, he says, now you are the light of the world. 1 John 1.5 says, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. John 1, 5, the gospel of John, he says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Later on in his gospel, in chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now Jesus is no longer in the world. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. His physical absence, in his physical absence, we now are the light of the world. Again, you is emphatic. You are It is a statement of being rather than doing. But the essence of light in and of itself, the characteristic that makes light light is that it illuminates. It's not something that light goes and does. It's what light is. So if you and I, if we the church are the light of the world, we are to shine. Simply being light, we shine and we illuminate. But we illuminate what? We illuminate the darkness in which we live. Let's look at what God did for us. In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, Apostle Paul says, For God who said, Let light shine out of the darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in your heart. Believer, Christian, God said, let light shine in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. There is a moment for every believer when the eyes of our heart are opened. We are illuminated to behold God's glory, that we begin to see that glory. And there's no other proper response to seeing that glory, having it illuminated upon our heart, but to respond in humble submission to that light. Not everyone does it. There are those that would reject that thing. But for the genuine believer, when we behold the glory of God and we have the response to see our own wickedness, our own depravity that we've walked in and we respond to Jesus who called us out of that darkness and into his marvelous light. Humbly submitting to him, his leadership for his salvation and walking away from the darkness in which we once walked. To bask in the light of his grace. That's what God has done for you and I. And in so doing, we become not lights in the world, but we become the light of the world. 
And there's a vast difference of being lights in the world. But no, as Jesus says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And Jesus is gone from the world to be at the right hand of the Father. And he's now made us reflectors of his light. As if we are that light. Charles Spurgeon observes, he says this, In his people, Christ still shines forth with even a brighter light than in the days of his earthly sojourn. He has 10,000 reflectors instead of 12. 10,000 times 10,000 tongues proclaim his gospel, and 10,000 times 10,000 hearts burn and blaze with the light of the divine word. And it is the word, according to Psalm 119, 105, that, that is a lamp unto the feet and a light unto our path. As reflectors of that true light, we walk by it, we should live by it, and we illuminate the way for those that do not. That is the purpose. That is how we are the light and the function of light. As we illuminate the way for those that walk in darkness, not knowing where they're going, John 12, 35. Who grope in the dark without light, Job 12, 25. Who going about in deep darkness don't know over what they stumble, Proverbs 4, 19. This world exists in darkness apart from Jesus Christ. And it stumbles around, not knowing what it's falling over. It's groping. You ever been, you ever wake up in the middle of the night and there's no moon coming through the windows at all? It's pitch black. Maybe the power goes out as recently. There's no clock on a stove or on the microwave that illuminates anything. And you wake up and it's dark and it's even your own house. You know where things are at, but you might still be a little asleep and you start feeling around. We can all relate to that feeling of being in utter darkness, feeling around, trying to find where are we going. That's the state of those that are lost in this world They're spiritually wandering around in the dark, not knowing where to go, but they feel secure in some wicked way. Because the ignorance that is in them. But Jesus Christ says, you are the light of the world to illuminate their path, to point them. He says, we are, we're a city. He says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. It just shines. It's just there. We make the way clear. In the daytime, the city is on the hill. You can't miss it. In the nighttime, the lights shine and illuminate that city. You can't miss it. It cannot be hidden. However, just like there's an admonition for the saltiness that's lost its taste, that is contaminated by the mineral in which it was pulled from, But he says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. But then in verse 15, he says, Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all that's in the house. He says, that's what we don't do. We should not do that, but people do. The warning there is, do not be one that would light a lamp and put her under a basket. How foolish, again, is that? Like salt that's lost its tastiness. It's a foolish thing to light something and put it under a basket. What what is the purpose of doing that? But nonetheless, under that basket, the light is still shining. Just the rays of its light are hindered. He says, in the same way, he says, let your light shine before others. Now, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Here is the purpose. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. The church is the ecclesia. We're the called out ones. Jesus could have called us out and called us up. Just just like that, to be with him. What a wonderful thing that would have been. The wonder and glory to be in the presence of the King, the Savior, our Creator. Church, I can't wait to be called up. I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to be called up. But until then, we're called out. 
And our purpose is that so we would shine so that this world would see our good works. And them seeing our good works, they would give glory to the Father who is in heaven. The word good there in the Greek is kalos. And it's not an indication of quality. It's not something that's good in quality, but it means beautiful, handsome, excellent, eminent. It's the choice thing. It's surpassing. It's precious. It's useful. It's suitable. It's commendable. It's admirable. When Jesus said, they may see your beautiful, wonderful works. This world will see that beauty and they'll have no condition upon them except to take it in and respond to it. That should be the position of our hearts. We pursue good works, not for the works themselves and the end in themselves to glorify ourselves, but it's so that people would see those things. The reason we went out a couple weeks ago and we did Stone Point Serves was so that people would see our good works, the beauty of the church being the light, being the salt of the earth, so that they may see and respond and glorify God. Who is in heaven. Paul reminds the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 5, 8, and 9. He says, For at one time you were darkness. Church, never forget that fact. As we look at this world that's walking in darkness, we look at the sin of this world, the depravity of this world, and we want to start pointing fingers. As Brandon talked about last week, we want to start shunning people. We want, I love you from a distance. We want to get away from it all. I want to do me here, you do you there. That's not at all what we should be reminding ourselves. We should be reminding ourselves that at one time we were darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. He says, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good, right, and true. The fruit of light that Paul speaks of is the good works that Jesus speaks of. It is that which shines on the hill. Church, it cannot be denied. It cannot go unnoticed. If it's allowed to shine. But it can be rejected. For which you and I are not responsible. All we are responsible for is shining. And if we're doing that in purity. If we're truly salty. The world takes notice, but whether or not they accept it or reject it is upon them, and that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to be what Jesus says we are. But sadly, in too many places, the church is not, and the decay is quickening. But that does not mean that we just let it go. Until we are called up, we're sent into the world to be these things. Our responsibility is to be salt and to be light. Not from the earth, but in the world and strictly for it. What a grand responsibility we have to not take lightly, but to pursue prayerfully. And seek the Lord on areas of our life that need to be shored up. Areas that need to be cleaned up. Areas that need to be purified. So that we can confidently sit in a barber's chair to get our hair trimmed. And be engaging a world just by the pure nature of our character. That someone sitting there may see, hear, and think differently about this world. I love that quote because Woodrow Wilson did not say that he even spoke to D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody didn't speak to him. But he saw the life that was being laid out. The salt and the light. And it moved him and however it moved him. I promise you, church, you'll never engage. You'll never have a gospel conversation. If you're not living according to the gospel. If you want to be left alone, 
Be salty as the world defines it. Put a basket over your head. But the responsibility is clear, and I pray that we learn to walk in that in better ways, and that's even for my own heart. Let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you for this morning. and Father, I read your word and, and, and study it and, and, and be moved and inspired by it, Lord. But you didn't write your word, Lord, to just inspire us. Lord, you wrote your word and gave it to us to convict us. Convict us of our sin that we would humbly come to you, Lord, and allow you to change us, to mold us into your image. But then as image bearers, Lord, your word tells us, Lord, how we are to live, what we are to do. And this world tells us otherwise in several different ways, Lord. The enemy is so crafty at twisting even your word to use it against us, Lord. And in our foolishness, Lord, we fall prey. But Father, I ask that you teach us, Lord. That you would place deep within your people. Here at Stone Point Church. Stone Point Church in Edgewood. Stone Point Church in Wills Point, Lord. I pray and ask that you settle the hearts of your people right here. To seek your face. To seek a deeper understanding of what it means to be salt of the earth, to mean what it means to be the light of the world, Lord. What does it mean for us? Not the individual in the room, Lord. I pray that we would seek your face, Lord, on what it means for us as a body, that we would lock arms together, Lord, that we wouldn't wait any longer to gather together and to go and do. We wouldn't feel as if we have to isolate ourselves or we have to do something that someone isn't. Lord, would you move us to lock arms together as a body unified according to your purpose to accomplish your ends on this earth? But it's overwhelming to think of the earth. Lord, would you draw us right here to the communities in which you have placed us to be salt and to be light? That we would hold off the decay for just moments longer. That someone may come to your salvation. Father, help us. We love you and we thank you and it's in your name we pray. Amen.